Good morning, Mark chapter 1 in your Bible. Let me ask you to open it to that place. If you'll help me to preach God's word today. I know that uh, if you've been around here a while, you know we were in Mark's gospel here in chapel a year and a half or so ago and uh, preached through it. Wonderful time. But we were taking some pretty broad strokes uh, growing through there and some lengthier passages of scripture. I'd like to lean into one of those in Mark chapter 1 uh, this morning. Mark is the human author, of course, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so that makes this God's word for us. And we begin reading in verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, talking about Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. The term genericide is used to describe what happens to the name of a product when it begins to be used uh, more broadly, more generically, to refer to uh, other brands uh, that make a similar kind of product. All of us are familiar with examples of this. There have been a number of them through the years. Products like aspirin and Band-Aid and Coke is uh, a, a big one, uh, jacuzzi, frisbee, uh, Kleenex, uh, all of us uh, probably refer to all tissues as Kleenex, even if it says uh, puffs or uh, something else on, on the, the box. And anytime that happens, that product runs the risk of its name being diluted because it's being used so broadly and it loses its meaning. There are actually financial consequences, serious consequences to this, because by law, a company can actually lose its trademark rights to that name because it's been sucked into the mainstream of a particular industry. I want to suggest to you this morning that the genericide of the Great Commission also has serious consequences. Steve Richardson, who is the president of Pioneers USA, wrote a book that was released earlier this year uh, asking the question, in fact, it's the title of the book, Is the Commission Still Great? Christianity Today, just a couple of weeks ago on October 17th, released an article that was adapted from that in which, in which Richardson is actually posing the question, are we in danger? Are we in danger of letting the Great Commission fall victim to genericide? This is what he says. The words missions and missionary are in danger of genericide. When my parents first went to the field, missionaries were ministers of the gospel in a long-term, full-time, cross-cultural capacity, usually overseas. During my lifetime, Christians have started using the terms missions and missionaries in a less specific way. Some Christians now define missions broadly enough to include virtually any activity of the church, including ministering with local con within local congregations, serving the poor, and fighting injustice. We are a great commission seminary. Saw a video about that at the beginning of the service. Underscores our mission statement to glorify God by equipping students to serve the church and fulfill that great commission. We say every classroom is a great commission classroom. And probably every one of us this morning that names the name of Christ would say, I, at least I want to be a great commission Christian. And I want to be a great commission leader. 
But I want us to understand this morning, when we come to this passage of Scripture, I want us to understand that if we allow the term Great Commission, just like the terms mission and missional, to fall, fall victim to genericide, where we begin to refer to everything we do as missions and as the Great Commission, then what we're going to see is the Great Commission become the Great Confusion and ultimately lose its meaning. And so this is what I want to propose to you from this passage of Scripture this morning as we look at it together. And that is, and please listen to me very carefully, we must, we must as believers in Jesus Christ, as gospel ministry leaders, as a seminary, as well as the churches that we go out to shepherd, we must be willing to intentionally say no to some ministry opportunities in order to say yes to Great Commission Living. Let me say it again. We're going to have to be willing to say no to some good ministry opportunities if we are going to say yes to Great Commission living and ministry. I want to show you this in this passage of Scripture this morning. I'm going to do something kind of weird. Uh, I actually want to work back. I want to work through these verses backwards. Uh, so for you expository legalists, it will still, which I consider myself one of those, that it will still be verse by verse, uh, but it's just going to be going backwards. Maybe I'll coin a new term, verse in reverse. I don't know. But I think it's important, and, and, and I hope this will become evident before we're through. I think it's helpful, at least, for us to do that in order to understand why the Holy Spirit put this paragraph in the Bible, or at least one of the primary reasons. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by reminding you about the commission we have. And I know it is just a reminder because we're familiar with it. We know why God's left us on the planet. We know the instructions that Jesus gave us. So we're going to look at a reminder of the commission we have. But then I want to show you something that... That, that may rub some of us uh, a, a little hard. And that is, I want to show you a challenge that we face in staying focused on that commission. And it may surprise you where it comes from. And then I want us to see, I want us to see the communion that we will need in order to stay focused on that commission and not allow it to fall victim to genericide. So let's start with the commission that we have. In verse 38, the Bible says that, that it really puts this paragraph in its context, a context that is on the morning after Jesus uh, has spent what probably became a very typical day, but one of the early days of his public ministry. I know you know the story. In Mark chapter 1, he goes into the synagogue in verse 21 on the day before, and he preaches so powerfully. People say, that guy's not from around here. We've never heard anything like this. They sense the gravity, the weightiness of of his authority and the message that he brought. And then immediately Jesus goes head to head with a, with a demon possessed man. He casts the demon out. So he's doing powerful teaching. He's doing spiritual warfare in a way that few of us will ever do. He goes home for Sunday lunch or Sabbath lunch to Peter's house. And, 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 and there, uh, when most of us would just be looking to relax and breathe a little bit after a service, Jesus engages in some pastoral ministry. Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a debilitating fever. He heals her. Word is beginning to spread. People are beginning together. And, and then apparently, as verses 32 through 34 tell us, seemingly late into the night, he's healing people of sicknesses. He's casting out demons. He's, he's doing all of those things. A pretty long day in the life of Jesus. This paragraph takes place on the morning after that. And in the statement in verse 38, Jesus seems to set the course for the thrust of his ministry on earth leading up to the cross. And he says, let's go to the next towns that I may preach there also because that's why I came out. Now, I want to call your attention to two characteristics of Jesus' ministry on earth that he identified as the reason he was on the planet leading up to the cross. 
And, and I want to say to you, they're the same two things that are characteristic of our work, our lives, our ministry, our mission. The first one is gospel proclamation. Twice in verses 38 and 39, the word in the English, in our English text, preached is used. There are a number of, of words in the language of the New Testament that are all translated preached with just various shades of meaning. This particular word is a word that means uh, to announce or to herald, particularly with regard to good news. And, and it, it's a word that certainly is used in different places in the New Testament as well as in Mark's gospel to refer to the formal preaching event. It's used of Jesus in Mark's gospel in the formal way. He was a preacher. John the Baptist was a preacher, and this word is used to describe it. But Mark does not limit this word to the formal preaching event, this idea of heralding good news, announcing good news is something that is used to describe a lot of other people. In the very next paragraph here in this chapter, it's going to be used of a guy who's healed of leprosy. Jesus heals him of leprosy, and this guy goes heralding this, this news. A little bit later, a couple of chapters over, it's going to be used to refer to that guy from Gadara that was that Jesus uh, uh, exercised a whole bunch of demons out, and he goes heralding. It's used of, of, uh, of Jesus' disciples. It's used of the crowds that heard Jesus. In other words, there's a whole lot of other people that did heralding than just formal preachers. I think, I think it it's really has application for both ways in this passage of Scripture. As I said, Jesus, like John the Baptist, uh, and certainly his disciples later on, were formal. They were preachers. They were heralds in the formal sense. But I, I think here, when Jesus sets the course of his work on earth and establishes this as the thrust of his ministry, he's probably using it at least to include the responsibility of every single one of us, and that is to live lives heralding the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I just want to remind you what you already know. This is why we're on the planet we're not on the planet primarily to be pastors or missionaries or stay-at-home moms or athletes or students or engineers or CEOs or however else we might put bread on our table. We as believers in Jesus Christ have been given this same assignment, and that assignment is gospel proclamation, telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the thrust of Jesus' ministry. There was a second part of it. And that's just spiritual opposition. I want you to notice there in verse 39 that the text says that in Mark's summary statement, he went throughout all Galilee preaching. We just uh, addressed that in their synagogues and doing something else. Why? Casting out demons. Why? Why? Why was that part of the focus of, our ministry, of his ministry? Because it's the natural result of gospel proclamation. And that is that the forces of hell, Satan and all of his minions, are opposing this mission, this purpose, this reason for being on the planet. Now, we know that it happened in a more dramatic tangible, visible way while Jesus was on earth. Some believers struggle with that, and they think something's wrong. Do we not have enough faith? Are we not living holy enough lives? Because we don't, we don't seem to see this demonic possession uh, and, and these demonic forces as vivid as we do on the pages of the New Testament. There's a reason for that. And that reason was his identity, who he is as the Holy One of God, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, God incarnate. That had a way of bringing demonic forces out of the woodwork. Read history prior to Jesus getting on the scene. You didn't see the same dramatic, vivid uh, demonstration of demon possession as you do in the New Testament. And if you read church history, you'll discover is that we really haven't seen it like that since then. 
Why? His identity, who he was, brought them out of the woodwork, much like you might take a a mixture of baking soda and water and apply it to a bee sting in which the bee has left the stinger inside your skin. That baking soda and water will draw out the stinger so you can remove it and, and, and let the wound begin to heal. That's what happened when Jesus was on earth. His presence and his power drew them out. But listen to me, come in here real close. That doesn't mean that demonic activity and spiritual opposition to gospel proclamation isn't just as real in our day. It may be more covert. Demons operate more in a stealth way. But understand this. If you live your life and you shepherd your ministry with this mission of gospel proclamation, that spiritual opposition will be there. Jesus said to Peter after that great confession, he said, it's going to be on that rock. I'm going to build my church, talking about himself, I think. And you remember what he says? He said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Paul, at the end of that great spiritual warfare passage in Ephesians chapter 6, after he talked about all those pieces of of armor, of spiritual armor, really leads it to a place that many people that study that passage don't go. And that is to its ultimate end. When he cries out and asks for the prayers of the Ephesians, their earnest prayers, so that boldness would be given to him In the proclamation of the gospel, Jesus and Paul understood that this spiritual opposition would continue. And listen, beloved, that's a pretty good description of the mission that we're on, the reason you've been left on the planet and I've been left on the planet, to do gospel proclamation and be ready for spiritual opposition. It's going to come. But you know what? That raises a question right at this point. We've got to ask the question, why? Why was it important so early in Jesus' ministry for him to clarify that? I mean, just coming out of the gate, it seems like, okay, that's a given. Everybody knows this. His disciples know it. Why why did Jesus make that statement that is recorded right there in verse 38? Why did he have to do that? I'll tell you, he had to do it because he knew. He knew that he was already facing what would be the greatest challenge of his staying focused on the mission that God had set him on. So I want to show that to you. I want to show you the challenge he faced, but I want you to know it's the same challenge. The same challenge that you and I face. Jesus knew. He knew before he went to bed that night, when he got up that morning, that he was about to face a challenge, listen, that posed maybe the biggest threat to his ministry, and it wasn't. Watch this now. It wasn't the blatant spiritual opposition of demonic forces, but it was a challenge that came from within his own camp, and it'll be the same for you. Let me show you this challenge that we face The disciples got up that morning, and they couldn't find Jesus. He wasn't anywhere around. And so in verse 36, Mark tells us that Simon Peter and those that were with him searched for him. This word translated search in my English translation, this is actually the the only time this word is used in the New Testament. It's a strong word, and and, and the root of it actually means to, to track something or to pursue something, but it has a prefix on the front of it that intensifies it, that really makes it a a description of, of tracking someone down, like a hunter would track down an animal. This was an intense, serious search. They were in hot pursuit of him. And the text says that they found him, and they said to him, everyone is looking for you. And I just, for the sake of time, want to jump right to it and and tell you, I, I, I think those five words, brothers and sisters, listen to me, I think those five words 
are a pretty good articulation of maybe the greatest challenge that you and I will face to us staying focused on why we're on the planet and not allowing this mission that we are on, the great commission we've given, to fall prey to genericide. Let me show you what I'm talking about. You can just take the different words in that phrase. Let's just start with the word everyone. And what I want to do is I want to give you a, I want to give you a, 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 a show you some decisions you're going to have to make, not just once, but throughout your ministry that every single one of us will have to make. Jesus had to make. And I think the first one is attached to that word everyone. Here's, here's the first decision that you're going to have to make, I'm going to have to make, the first choice we're going to have to make, and that is that we will have to choose our calling over the crowd. You know, in Mark's gospel, there is what Bible scholars refer to often as the Markan secret. And it's just a reference to the many times in Mark's gospel that Jesus does what he does in the next paragraph with this leper, and that is he, he does something supernatural, otherworldly, something that verifies his messiahship, but then he says, don't tell anybody. And he does that a number of times. Now, some Bible scholars think that the reason that Jesus does that is he didn't want to unveil his Messiahship too soon, but wait till later in his ministry until the right time. And I, I understand that, but I, I can't look at the things Jesus said and did throughout Mark's gospel without saying, hey, he's not hiding anything. I mean, only the Messiah could do that kind of stuff. There's another thought, and that is that the mark and secret is just a reference to the fact that Jesus knew that not everybody was pursuing him. Not everybody that came to hear him preach or came to where he was was doing it for the right reasons. And many of them just were doing it because they needed a cosmic Costco or a, div a, a, a divine doctor of some types that could meet their temporal, physical needs. And here, Jesus seems to acknowledge the fact that there were at least some that were gathering, looking for him, everyone, part of the everyone that was in that crowd. So sometimes in Mark's gospel, Jesus would say, don't tell anybody. Other times he would say, let's just go on down the road. Let me just tell you, you are going to be plagued. You're going to be plagued by the scream, everyone is looking for you. And there's going to be a lure in that many times, the lure of the crowd that will pull you away, will seek to pull us away from remaining focused on our mission of gospel proclamation. Sometimes the lure of the crowd is just rooted in our arrogance and our pride and our self-glorification. We think more of ourselves than we should. And so we like it when there's a lot of people. Some of it, some of that lure will come from, from just the nature of, uh, of the mentality in the Western church especially, and that is that bigger is better, and, 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 and the more the merrier and the larger the crowd, the more indication that is of, of something happening, something spiritual happening. There will also be the lure, listen, in particular sub-callings in our lives. And I want you to listen to that very carefully because most of us in the room today would say, you know, I'm called to something. I hope that's part of the reason that you're here. But let me just tell you something. Be careful. Be careful that the lure of the crowd to a particular arena of ministry that you define as your calling in life doesn't give you a pass on the ultimate calling that is on all of our lives. And this is a real danger. I, I, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I'm a seminary professor. And I hope there are all good things that are involved in that. And, and many of them involve crowds. They involve preaching to groups of people like this right here. And you know how easy it is for me to begin to think, you know, this is my calling. This is what I'm called to preach. I'm called to pastor. I'm called to be a seminary professor. And without realizing it, lose sight of the fact that the ultimate reason Jim Shaddix is on the planet is gospel proclamation. It's to tell people how to miss hell and make heaven. 
the lure of the crowd, you're going to have to choose your calling. And when I say your calling, I'm not talking about youth ministry or church planting. I'm not talking about the pastorate. I'm not talking about this particular discipline or that particular discipline. Regardless of what your ministry calling is, don't ever lose sight of the fact that your calling is gospel proclamation. There's something else here, another, another decision we're going to have to make, and that is, I, I think it's choosing, it's choosing the important over the urgent. You know, reflected in that crowd, regardless of what some of their motives were, was, you know, there were, were some legitimate needs, right? There were people with cancer. There, there, there were people that were epileptics. There were people that were demon-possessed. There were legitimate needs in the crowd, Now put that together with the verses that we've already talked about and hear Jesus say, let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also because that's why I came out. Did Jesus just really do that? Did he just really turn his back on some people that had legitimate physical needs? Legitimate spiritual needs from the standpoint of demand. Did he just walk away from that? And the answer to that question, as hard as it may be, is yes. Yes, he did. Why? Because he didn't love people? He didn't care about them? Of course not. But because he knew that there would always be the assault of many needs, people pressing in, searching for him, looking for him. Those people were already lined up that morning. They were already lined up. This was urgent. The apostles come and say, everybody's looking for you. Why are you out here? It was an urgent need. And in the midst of that, Jesus said, no. We need to go to the next town so that I can do the most important thing that I came out to do. That's a tough call right there. And let me just say, prospective students, students here at Southeastern training to be ministry leaders, let me tell you, some of the toughest decisions you will have in life and ministry won't be the decisions between right and wrong. They will be the decision between good and best. And see, that's what's happening right here. Jesus is choosing the important over the urgent. And every single one of us will be assaulted constantly with groups of people, individuals, crowds. And they will be saying, everyone is looking for you. But if you don't understand the difference between what is important and what is urgent. You will live your life and you will carry out your ministry in a reactionary fashion, just reacting to this urgent need and reacting to that urgent need and reacting to this urgent need and lose sight and lose involvement in the most important thing that you could be doing, and that is gospel proclamation. I think there's a third decision that we're going to have to make. It's probably attached best to the last part of that phrase, everyone is looking for you, and that is the for you. And here's the decision. It's a decision to choose between your purpose and your popularity. You know, Mark talks more about the humanity of Jesus than any other gospel writer. He wasn't immune from the temptation to be lured by the fact that people wanted him. They wanted to be around him. They wanted him to do something for him. They were after him. But what you're looking at right here is Jesus resisting that temptation and making a choice and saying, no, I didn't come to be popular. I came for the purpose of gospel proclamation. And that's what I need to stay focused on. And that's the decision that he's making here. It's a decision you and I will have to make over and over and over again. There is something about being needed, isn't it, that it's alluring to us. We like it. 
when people want us, when people need us, and especially if they think we're the only one that can help them. There is something that is magnetic about that that draws us. And I want to tell you something. This lure of being popular can become much more dangerous. It seems like there's a lot of ministry leaders today that are more interested in building a brand than they are making disciples. More interested in developing a platform so that people know their name and are aware of them. It's almost like influencers on social media. The more people we can get to know who we are and listen to what we say draws us some time draws us sometime in getting caught up with our own popularity as, as opposed to the purpose we have been left on the planet, and that is gospel proclamation. Let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to choose your calling over the crowd, and that calling is gospel proclamation. Let me encourage you to always be on guard, to choose the important over the urgent, and that important thing is gospel proclamation. And let me exhort you today, as I exhort myself, to always choose your purpose, the purpose of gospel proclamation over your own popularity. Now, we come to that place right there. It's likely that many of us, myself included, I'm making a confession here. Look at that. We know where we live. We know the reality of those decisions there and those choices to look at that challenge on our ministry and say, I'm not sure I can do it. Is it possible? Is it possible for a man or woman in gospel ministry leadership to always choose their calling over the crowd, to always choose the important over the urgent, to always choose the purpose of gospel proclamation over their own popularity. We might be somewhat intimidated by that, but yet that's, that's where we back up into verse 35 and we see the incredible resource that our Lord has given us to be able to do that. And so I want you to see the communion, the communion that we have to have if we're going to be able to make those hard choices and remain focused on the mission that our Lord has called us to. I think it's when we back up to verse 35 that maybe, at least maybe it's just me, but I, I think for me, this is where I see the value of backing through this passage of Scripture. Let me tell you why. Because if, if I just start with verse 35, you know what I'm tempted to do? I'm tempted to just really lean into the importance of prayer in general and all of the reasons that we need to be men and women of prayer and, to, and, and to, 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 to see how Jesus did that and to think about how we need to do it. But, but what I want you to see this morning is I want you to see that I think verse 35 is in the Bible because Jesus knew how crucial it would be for him to meet the challenge that he knew he was about to face. In other words, there is a very specific role that sacrificial prayer plays in enabling us to stay focused on fulfilling this mission that we're on. And it's not always an easy thing, but it is the communion with our Father that we cannot neglect. Verse 35 says, Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed, and he went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. I think Mark sets this verse in stark contrast to that really busy day and late night that Jesus just had coming off of verse 34. A day in which, you know, a, a morning in which I think, man, I, I need to sleep a little bit later. You know, I may have done a lot of good things. Cast out demons, preach powerfully, healed sick. Jesus could have looked at all of those things. Lots of things have been done for the kingdom. Need to take a little break. And then Mark drops this. He drops this in here that Jesus 
rising very early, a long while before daylight, went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Why? Because he knew. He knew the challenge that he was about to face, and it wasn't going to be the assault, the blatant, vivid assault of demonic forces, though they certainly are behind this as well, but it was going to be a challenge that arose among his own disciples. And he knew, listen to me, come in here real close. He knew the only way he would be able to battle it would be with sacrificial communion with his father. Two characteristics, two disciplines maybe that I will challenge you with as we close with regard to this. Number one, find, find an unhurried time. Mark puts this on the calendar of the day pretty clearly. Very early in the morning would have been the last watch of the night, 3 to 6 a.m. While it was still dark, pushes the time to the front end of that. So this was probably more like 3 or 4 in the morning. Now listen to me. I don't think the reason we've got this here is because Jesus was trying to say everybody needs to get up at 3, 4 in the morning every day to pray. I know some of you are glad to hear that, right? I don't even think the reason that he, did, that he did this at this particular point was just to emphasize the importance of sacrificial prayer. I, I think the reason is, is because he knew if he was going to meet that challenge, the challenge he was about to face in order to stay focused on his mission, he was going to need some unhurried time with the Father. This may not be all of our prayer times every day, but beloved, listen to me. We've got to have some prayer. We've got to have some prayer seasons that don't have a period on them. When we are unrushed, we are unhurried because God has wired this thing so that there is something about unhurried communion with him that is absolutely essential if we're going to be able to resist the temptation. That's going to pull us away from our mission. The second discipline is this. Find, find an undistracted place. So it says he went out and found a desolate place, and there he prayed. Words used five times in three different contexts in Mark's gospel, all the time related to getting away from the crowd in an insulated place. Seems today, because we're so busy, we think all we can do is multitask prayer. we got to add it to something else, right? And, and certainly, I think we should multitask prayer all that we can, but we can't limit our prayer lives to this. There is something, there is something about focused, undistracted prayer that God has wired into the economy of the mission that we're on that is absolutely essential if we're going to be able to resist the temptation, the challenge that challenges our mission and puts it at risk of genericide. I heard a great Bible expositor ask one time how he protected his study time in order to prioritize his preaching. And he said, I exercise the ministry of planned neglect. I plan to neglect some things in order to prioritize others. I think we have to do that with the Great Commission. We're going to have to plan to neglect some things in order to prioritize this Great Commission, this mission that we are on. And I want to challenge us today. Let's do that in our individual lives. Let's do it in our mission statements and our core values in our churches. Let's do it in every Great Commission classroom in our Great Commission seminary. Pray with me. God, help us with this, Lord. We know it is a lure that pulls us. It's a strong, this challenge that comes in our own churches, in our own seminary. We pray for grace to be men and women of prayer who seek you knowing that at least part of the reason for that is to give us the strength and the wisdom and the discernment and the ability to be able to, be able to resist the challenge and stay focused on our mission. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.